So, hello everybody. I'm very excited to work with uh, Shai Baranga. Uh, Shai is a uh, and a visiting faculty at Google Research. Shai is affiliated with many institutions. Among them are Science Institute of Berkeley, CCSB, uh, Princeton University, and Google Brain. Today, we'll speak with us about uh, on extending the generalization survey towards addressing uh, modern challenges in machine learning. So, Shai, thank you for being here and stay zero. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me and um, thanks everyone, everybody for coming. Okay. More people are joining, great. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's really nice to be here. I already came last night and it's the first night since I don't know how many months that I slept more than seven hours or five hours even, which was really great. So I'm, I'm <laughs> um, okay, so uh, yeah, so yeah, so I will talk about a couple of works. Um, and uh, the common theme is that in both of them, we try to, to, to modify or to adjust the classical definitions of, uh, of, of learning, of statistical, you know, pack learning uh, towards capturing um, phenomena that we, we observe in practice, mostly in deep learning, but not only. Yeah, so this talk is really in a sense about definition. So please, and, and I will be very happy if you can make it a discussion, if you can, if you can interact with me. Uh, and I don't mind if we only do half of the talk. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions and to comment, I'll be grateful. Okay, so, so this talk is indeed about the generalization and the generalization is perhaps the defining property of machine learning algorithms, right? It is the ability to correctly classify unseen data based on a finite training set. So, and the background is that the traditional uh, machine learning theory and in a sense, even statistics, they do not explain uh, generalization in modern algorithms. Okay, so I will, I will uh, discuss it in more detail soon, but um, in a nutshell, the reason is because the traditional theory is based on a worst case perspective, which reduces generalization to optimization, to empirical risk minimization over restricted classes. Whereas modern algorithms, such as deep neural networks, they use huge hypothesis classes, so, so use uh, models with, you, with many, many parameters. And um, yeah, and so it's not really the same see, with, that we, we've been taught in the classical, um, theory and this but this is not a bad thing this really poses exciting and interesting research questions and i think it's really a great uh, time to to do theory um so the approach i take in most of my research and in particular what we, what we present today is to try to revisit the axioms the theoretical foundations of, of uh, the, the basic definitions to circumvent the traditional worst case perspective and to aim for a, for a modern perspective, which is more every case. Every case in a sense that it is, it is able to adapt to specific properties of the algorithms and the input. So we will discuss two attempts. Uh, the first work, uh, which appeared in, in the last uh, talk, uh, we present a, distribution dependent variant of of of, uh, of pack learning theory and this is a joint work with uh, Steve Hanek, uh, Ramon van Hendel and Amir Udayov and Olivier <laughs> and in the second work we again we slightly change the definition the classical definition in, in a way which allows to to model data dependent assumptions in a really convenient way and uh, this is joint work with uh, Noga, with Steve and with Ron. And in bo both of these works, so the one common uh, thing to do both of these works is that we really change the syntactical difference from the classical definition is, is, is really, really small. So in the first one, we'll just see, we change the order of an existential quantifier and a universal one. So instead of uh, exist for all, we have for all exist in the definition, I will, I will discuss it soon. 
And in the second one, we simply allow to, to, to also um, include partial functions. So syntactically, the definitions are really, really close to the classical definition, but the mathematical landscape that arises as a result is completely different in a, in a surprising way. For us, it was a big surprise for me. Okay, so let's begin with the, okay, so, so first I will remind you the classical uh, definition according to pack learning. Then we'll discuss the, the distribution dependent framework and then the, the data dependent framework. Okay, so let's begin with uh, pack learning. So I will do it fast because uh, unless you will ask questions, but I assume most of you are familiar. So a learning problem is a distribution and here we focus on classification. So the so we have a domain X and a label set, which is zero and one. A learning algorithm is a mapping or implements a mapping, which receives a, a sample, which is a sequence of examples and outputs a classifier, which is a function from X to zero one. And uh, right, so for example, we can have a, right, you can have X can be all possible images. The distribution can be all, uh, all the Yelp images uploads and the classification rule that we try to learn is whether it, the image contains a hot dog or not. And then the edge can be some neural network. And what is the goal? The goal is to, to minimize the error rate on future examples, right? So we want that this, this hypothesis that we output will correctly classify uh, random examples from the same source with high probability. Um, and in pack learning, we, we assume that there is an hypothesis class. It's, it's a set of classifiers, which is known to the algorithm. And in this talk, I will also focus on the realizable case, me meaning that we assume that uh, there is an hypothesis in the class that correctly classifies the, the examples. And then what is the definition of pack learning? So a class H is pack learnable if there exists a vanishing bound R of N that goes to zero as N goes to infinity and an algorithm such that for every realizable distribution P, the expected uh, error after seeing N examples is at most R of N. So the crucial point here is that this is a distribution free definition. The same rate R of N applies for every distribution P. Right, so we have one rate R of N, which applies for all distributions P. It's a, it's a, it's a distribution free definition. This is important, this, uh, this point, okay? So, okay, and then, you know, once you have a definition like this, so the fundamental question is which classes are learnable and how? And this has been answered, uh, I guess, in the 70s or 60s even by Vapdik and Chavonemkis that there is, you can assign to every class of functions a combinatorial parameter called the VC dimension. And this parameter captures back learnability in the sense that the class is learnable if and only if the VC dimension is finite. And um, moreover, the VC dimension really controls this distribution free rate. So the distribution free rate is D over N up to some constants. This is the, the right answer. And uh, yeah, for the, I guess, so it's not so important what is the definition of the VC dimension, but it's a, it's a combinatorial definition. You, it's the maximum um, size of a set that is shattered by the class and shattered means that you see all possible patterns uh, when you restrict the functions, the binary functions to this class, to this set. Okay, and the how to learn. So we know what is learnable and how do you learn in pack learning? So there is the, celebrated empirical risk minimization principle. And this is also followed by the proof of learnability that any algorithm which outputs a function H in the class, which is consistent with the input data is a sound learner. We'll generalize well to future examples. And uh, this is follows from a uh, uniform convergence, which tells us more generally that uh, if the VC dimension is D, then what you see is what you get. And you, you take N examples, you look at the performance of each hypothesis from the class on the training set. 
it will be roughly the same like the performance on the population. Right, so the take home principle from pack learning theory is that it reduces generalization to optimization. You can forget about all these statistics. Just take your input sample and optimize. Find an hypothesis that minimizes the, the empirical risk. And this is very compelling, very nice, very intuitive, but unfortunately it's not general as we will see now. Okay. So, Indeed, this principle does not apply uh, in, in modern algorithms. And um, so there is, I think, by now a pretty long line of, of mostly empirical work that demonstrate that, that deep learning algorithms do not obey uniform convergence. One of the first works by Jean Benjo, Hard, and Drecht, and Vinyals, um, what they did is they they trained convolutional networks with various levels of injected noise. So they took, I think they, it was the, not sure if MNIST or CIFA, but I think it was like 10 labels. And, and what they did is that uh, every, every label, so you, the, the, the examples were drawn from the, from the population. And then each label was flipped to a random label with some small probability that varied, right? So uh, like in the realizable case, it was zero, but then they, they increased it. And what they observed is that the sample error, the empirical error of the, of the hypothesis, the neural, the, the, the algorithm outputs is always zero. This, this was like a, a, a law, that all, it was always zero. However, because of the noise, we know that no hypothesis can reach zero error on the population. It's at least uh, whatever the noise is times one over times nine over ten, because you have ten labels. So in particular, you don't have this what you see is what you get principle, right? What you see on the sample is not what you get in the population because you cannot get zero on the population. So right, so they always learn. They always uh, these algorithms. They always reach the optimal solution, the base optimal solution, but. Um, they always inter interpolate the data. And today we have all these uh, works on interpolation algorithms. So, but that was the basic empirical observation. Okay, so uh, yes. This is a property not of the algorithm, it's of the fact that they're overparameterized, right? If you think, if, if you train with a large enough sample, then like sure, sure. So, I mean, you can say that the amount of data and the, the article. Okay, but, but it's still a property of the algorithm. So, the algorithm uses a huge class which is overparameterized and it does something there. It's, it's not an, an arbitrary ERM, it's some, it's, there, there is some dynamics of the gradient, and we don't understand. I mean, I don't understand exactly what is happening, but. It certainly not. It does not obey the the traditional principle of ERM of doing empirical risk minimization over a restricted class, over which you do have what you see is what you get, over which you do expect that the empirical loss will be a good proxy of the population loss. So this fails, right? This simple. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, this is a pro This is because you're. I think it's more than just that, that. It's true that the class that uh, neural nets uh, the algorithms use are overparametrized, but they are not arbitrary ERMs. It's not like, uh, right? So they pick. Uh, I think maybe the point is that this phenomenon that you're seeing deep learning is not new. In the sense that if you take linear classifiers and then change the, so, so you have the N by D matrix of n examples and d dimension. Now, change the problem a bit by adding another matrix of m by m, which is simply epsilon times the identity matrix. Mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> now the problem is overparameterized. Linearly separable. If you will train perceptron on this, you will get zero error. And you will get also generalization right why you, why you will get generalization for example because of margin yes okay? yes because the generalizing solution has high 
higher margin right. in non-generalized solution. Yes. So what I'm saying is that, saying that deep learning is an example where all our theory breaks is a bit overstatement. And uh, these type of things were already known before. That's true, that's true. And there were many theoretical works, yes. for example, yes. the margin yes. of non-uniform conditions. Yes. Stability, right? Yeah, yeah. Generalization, all of that was there before as generalization of path learning. So now the question is, and so so you can explain still in similar things to uh, the classical theory, also modern, uh, what you call modern uh, or everyday phenomena. Okay. So the question is, do we need to change the definitions? Or do we really need to change the definitions? Or do we need to work harder on classical definitions and just show that what happens in, for example, in deep learning is similar to what I described for perceptron? Right. Okay. So we, we will, okay. So I will get to all of these phenomena that you mentioned, margin, in, this, in, the, second, in the second work. But I think what, what we are trying to do is to, you see the definition of Puck learnability is very clean, it's very concise, it's very crisp. But the fundamental theorem of Puck learning, uh, which I learned from your book, is it really reduces generalization to optimization, right? So it does not, so even those, all those, um, all those phenomena that you mentioned, margin, these algorithm dependent bounds, they are, they are not really captured by, um, but it, 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 these are classical works, right? These are classical, uh, but, no, but... The margin, you have the same problem with Martin algorithms. If you take RBF term, for example, okay? So again, you have the problem of, you get overfit to everything, but still generalize, okay? So the same phenomena that uh, they have. Yes, yes. So you, you can explain these phenomena using traditional explanations, let's say, but, but, but the, at least this uh, basic definition, of Puck learnability, it, 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 so that's that's the that's the main point I want to and so and. I would be glad that uh, I want to see the new definition. Yes, yes. Yeah, so let's. The new definitions would be interesting to discuss the difference between. That I agree. And what people did with. Smart I agree. Words. I agree. So, but this is yeah. So let's get back to this in the second in the second work. Let me now present, um, and and then I'll be very happy. I think it's more relevant to the second uh, to the data dependent theory that. Uh, Okay, so now I'll, I'll present this theory of universal learning in which we, as I said, we just basically change the order of two quantifiers in the definition of, of background ability and, and observe a completely different mathematical landscape. So, Okay, so yeah, so, so the PAC model gives a worst case analysis. As we said, it's a uniform rate. The, this rate has to apply for every distribution, the learning rate. And we will discuss now an alternative framework, which we call universal rates. And what one surprising uh, thing we will see is that even exponentially fast learning rates are possible. And this was really, to me, it was a huge surprise. Um, and of course, once you, once you see that this uh, possibility is, is uh, possible, at least theoretically, you can try to exploit it and to design new learning rules. And also what was very nice is that there are many, a lot, a lot of nice combinatorics in the background. Um, okay, so let's recall first the definition of back learning. So remember that there is this rate R Right, so H is back learnable if there is a rate R, which is independent of P and an algorithm and the algorithm, the, the loss of the algorithm is always bounded by this rate R independent of the distribution. That's the, that's, that's the main point to remember, right? So the R of N is roughly the VC dimension of H over N and it is a distribution free rate. So maybe we can allow for some dependence on the distribution. Maybe we can change the definition a little bit and allow some dependence. So let's look at this uh, suggestion. So now we'll say that H is learnable at a universal rate R. If there exists an algorithm, so the algorithm uh, is, does not depend on the distribution, such that for every P, we have a pair of constants, 
which are distribution dependent. So this pair of constants, are, they may depend on P. And then again, for every N, you want that the learning rate, the, the error after N examples will be at most C times R of small C times N. Okay, so really, if you look at the definition of pack learning, all we did is we introduced these distribution dependent constants. So there are constants in the sense that they do not depend on N, N goes to infinity. You fix the learning problem, N goes to infinity. And then, um, okay, so that's the definition. So again, we, we just allowed some dependence on the distribution in the form of this, of this constants. Okay. Same definition as in matrix, universal learning? Uh, I don't think so, no. I think there are some. Uh... You don't remember? <laughs> I, as far as I remember, it's the same, but you know, I, I'm, I'm No, no. You... I, <laughs> I don't think it's the same definition. No, I think that there are some technical differences. We do infimum, you also, there, I think you do a minimum, but uh, we, just, uh, we give a very detailed comparison in the paper, but I also don't remember exactly the. Okay, so, so what is the difference? Let's try to see, to, to imagine, to, to see it on a graph. So if you think about it, the universal rates, so you fix, the, you fix the distribution D and then you observe the learning curve. You observe how, what is the population loss is a function of the size of the training set as N goes to infinity. And then for every distribution D, you have a different curve, right? You pick D and then you let the number of examples go to infinity and you measure the, the error rate. So really, if you think about it like this, what the pack definition does is you take the supremum over all realizable distributions of these curves. That, that, that is the worst case in the nature of, of pack. And, and by allowing this constants, this con in, inside the definition, you, you really, you can really focus on every case, on every curve separately. And, and really one surprising uh, thing was that there are problems, very simple problems that are not even pack learnable in fact, but also problems that are pack learnable in which there is an algorithm such that for every particular curve, the loss will drop exponentially fast. But the supremum will be still this good old D over N, this is I mentioned over N. Okay, so uh, yeah, so this is the main theorem from this paper is that every class H satisfies one of the following. So there is a trichotomy, there are only three cases. Either H, the easiest kind of classes are H's that are learnable at rate and at an exponential rate, e to the minus n. The middle level, we have H's that are learnable at an optimal rate of one over n. And, and the last uh, option is, is uh, arbitrarily slow rates. And there are only these, so it's really a trichotomy. So if, so if H is not in the first kind, if, it's can, if, it cannot, if there is no algorithm that can learn it at an exponentially fast rate, then you can already prove a lower bound of at least of one over N. And if it's not here, then, then, it's, then it's here. So it's really a trichotomy and you don't, you don't have optimal rates of let's say e to the minus square root n, this is impossible. And uh, maybe one thing I should have said I'll, I'll, uh, uh, is that under this definition, the class of all functions is learnable, right? So here, item three, it also contains the class of all functions, right? Which algorithm learns the class of all functions in this universal uh, definition? I'm sorry? MDA. Yes, for example, or is, even one nearest neighbor will, uh, will work, right? One nearest neighbor in the realizable setting, it learns any, anything, of course, in a distribution dependent way, right? Every, in the limit, it will learn every distribution, but of course, it, it will take it, um, it might take it a very, very long time to, to, to do so. So, um, yeah, so I, I should have said it earlier. 
So within this definition, once you allow the learning rate to depend on the problem, you can learn everything. And then if you can ask further how fast or what are the possible universal rates, then you get this trichotomy. There are only three options, and these are the options. Yes, you, you, you. You already asked. Ah, great. Class of all functions, all measurable All measurable, yeah, of course, you need all these. Uh, yeah, that's so not. All measurable functions on the continuous uh, zero one. Zero. Take one nearest neighbor, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty confusing, right? You think that you. you, yeah, you it might be measurable over space without the metric. Okay. Uh, go ask Ari Kontorovich. He will love to tell you about. Uh, it's that one? It, I mean, I don't know. Um, but talk to Arya, he's, he loves this. Yeah. Uh, probability independent in the sense that there is no probability such that a uh, distribution, sorry, distribution independent such as that there is no distribution for which one is happening then two is happening to another distribution so for the same class. No, no, okay. So remember that the definition was like this H is learnable at rate e to the minus n, Let, let's repeat the definition. If there is an algorithm such that for every realizable distribution, there will be a base b to the exponent, which is smaller than one, which depends on the distribution, such that after n examples, the loss will be at most b to the n. Okay? For every distribution. Yeah, there's also, also in diagnostics, I think something like this applies, but let's focus on the realizable, yeah. For every realizable distribution, so but but the thing is that the, the base of the exponent, so so the loss goes exponentially fast to zero, and the base of the exponent de might depend will depend on the distribution. Okay, so it's, so yeah, that's. By the way, this is really surprising. This thing with the exp if you think about it, like exponentially fast rate, like even if I give you. An hypothesis to tell you, look, this hypothesis is super good. It has lost at most epsilon for some tiny epsilon. Just to verify that, if you don't trust me, just to verify that, you will need one over epsilon examples. Just to test, just to estimate. So in a sense here, you are able to, to search, to find a good hypothesis much faster than you could do if an oracle would give you a good hypothesis and you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't trust this oracle. And untrusty is really, uh, I think, Surprising, like searching is easier than verifying in a sense. Um, okay, so, um, ah, okay, let me tell you now a little bit about how, by the way, how much time do I have? Uh, half, an half an hour, okay. Let me tell you a little bit, a little bit about, uh, about the proof. Okay, so, so, like as I told you, there is a combinatorial structure structure that uh, that is used to to prove this result. And for example, so the those classes that can be learned in an exponential rate are exactly those classes that do not shatter an infinite Lilston tree. And similarly, you have for the one over n case. So, what is an infinite Lilston tree? Let let me just tell you a little bit about the, the combinatoric behind it. So, so we say that H shatters or has an infinite decision tree if it shatters a complete infinite decision tree, right? So we have a, a decision tree, complete binary tree, a decision tree, whose nodes are labeled by points X from the domain. And then every branch, right? Once you, every hypothesis, every function defines a branch on the tree, right? So if H of X empty set is zero, you go left and then h of x zero might be one, and then you go right. Every function in the world defines a branch on the tree. And we say that the tree is shattered by a class if every node is reached by some function in the class. Okay? And, and this, so, this captures exactly those classes that can be learned exponentially fast. If H does not shatter such, such a tree, then it can be learned. Otherwise, it cannot be learned. And um, right, and moreover, if 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 it has no infinite list on tree, then it can be learned fast. Otherwise, you can cook a lower bound, a universal lower bound. The universal lower bounds are harder to prove because you need to fix the distribution of one over n. 
And what is the what is the idea? So or how to how to learn? So also also the proof here I think is 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 more um, rich than the the proof of uniform convergence of the of, of pack learnability. So right. So in pack learning you prove uniform convergence and then every ERM learns. Here what you do is you associate with every age an online learning game and. And then what you prove is that in this online learning game, either the adversary can win, and if the adversary can win, then you can find an infinite list on tree, and then you can prove a lower bound of one over n. Otherwise, the learner has a winning strategy, and if the learner has a winning strategy, then you get an online learning rule for h, and this online learning rule for h, then you need to do some kind of boosting uh, some kind of aggregation, and that's what gives you the the final um, algorithm, which has exponential rate. Yes. Can you? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, to understand the, the intuition here of why you have the exponential rate. Yeah. Let's take the finite of this class. Then it has the finite. Let me let me give you maybe a better example. Let's do something. Let's take a class with lives in dimension one. Okay. That's the that would be the simplest. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that we have an online learning algorithm that makes at most one mistake on the, okay? So assume we have a class which is only learnable with mistake bound one. Namely, there is an algorithm that makes at most one mistake on every realizable sequence, even chosen adversarially. I claim that this algorithm, so here we will not need the, the final, the last step. I claim that this algorithm already achieves exponential rate in the universal sense. Why? So pick any distribution which is realizable. Now, there are two options. Either the, the, the first hypothesis, the null hypothesis before it does any mistakes already has zero error, and then the rate will be arbitrarily fast or, Otherwise, there is some tiny probability, P, that it makes a mistake on random example. Now, the chance of not seeing this mistake n times, of not, of not sampling a mistake n times is at most one minus P to the n. Right, because it can be arbitrarily large. It's a constant. Yes, that is so true. That is true. Large. That is true. No, no. So this is a very abstract result. It applies to every class, and and this is how we do it. But one interesting um, thing that I learned. Let, let me rephrase my question. When we are doing a theory, any theory, in particular machine learning theory, we want to the question is, what is the purpose of of this theory? Okay, so in this dimension, the answer is very clear. First, it gives you a, an algorithm, the ERM algorithm. Second, it gives you, if you are coming to a, to a problem, you have your hypothesis class, and then you can prepare your class and know that you made that much of examples. So that there is, there is some uh, consequences of the theory. What are the consequences of this theorem? So I, I'm a, a, the practitioner come to the problem. Now I'm equipped with this theorem. It's an excellent question. Think? It's an excellent question. I still don't have a good answer to that, but I think that, um, okay. So let me tell you what I wanted to say before is that there is another work that more or less parallel to this one by, by Francis Bach and co-authors. And they also observed exponential rates and they also in linearly separable spaces and they connected it with margin and mistake bound. Mistake bound of, don't think it was perceptual, but, but something related. And maybe this is one possible insight that there is some connection between, between online learning, maybe tools from online learning can be, can be useful. But again, I don't, I really, I don't have a satisfying answer. This is something I'm thinking about. What so what would be? We can rephrase it as the class of only two hypotheses. Okay, it has little some dimension of one, and we know we just have h zero and h one, and, and we need to choose between them. And the mm -hmm. algorithm 
is exactly start with h0 until you get a mistake. Once you yes, get a mistake, yes. switch to yes, h1 yes. and you are done. Yes. Okay? But when when we come to this algorithm to, uh, to a practical problem, we don't know anything about how good it will work because it depends on on the distribution very, very heavily. No, but the algorithm does not depend on the distribution, right? The algorithm yeah, the not, performance. But the performance. The performance does, right. Right. But the, but the algorithm is the same as ERM, right? Because the, no, no, it's not the same as ERM. For two hypotheses. No, you, you have no, because you have some you have some you have some preference, right? It's more like regularized there. You begin with this one unless you see evidence that you need to switch to the next one. So there is some kind of model selection here. It's like, it's like ERM is arbitrary. Uh, uh, no, ERM is symmetric. ERM could also start with H1, right? And the ERM is... You can, you can be you can, you can say, okay, I have some scheme for child-breaking and do ERM. Okay, yes. So that's the same as the okay, but this, maybe you can present like this every interpolating algorithm, ERM with tie-breaking. I, I don't think, like ERM, usually you think about that it doesn't really matter how you implement it. Every ERM should work. ERM with tie-breaking is every interpolating algorithm, right? It, you can you can think of it as an ERM tie breaking. But, but, but is it true that ERM with arbitrary tie breaking No, no, no. Okay, so let me let me go there. No, not at all, not at all. So here somehow from the winning strategy, right? We have we define this game which is completely class dependent, and we do it abstractly for maybe for half a margin you can really understand it. And this game, the, or the winning strategy of the algorithm, the online learner defines the tie breaking if you want defines like a preference i don't not explicitly but this is maybe one way to think about it and then maybe you do according to this very specific preference tie breaking uh, yeah this is maybe one way to interpret it but let me maybe so, so let, let's see an example an answer to my question okay so, the majority of the tie breaking is a consequence of this theory be yes, yes, but again, it, it, it's, not, it's not correct formally what you just said. So it, 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 maybe it explains countable classes. It's correct every finite hypothesis class, which yeah. argues that it's the only thing that is because everything is finite. No, I mean, you can do gradients with finite classes, right? I mean, you need... You do it with finite classes, your work is a computer. But and there are of course, of course, but, but the way we think about it, but... But the way we think about it, the way we model it, the way we analyze it is using infinite, uh, right? Uh, you can analyze it with finite bits, and you will have the same bounds as uh, variables, and you will get the same bounds. Okay. Let's 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 continue. Let's continue. Um, so here is an example of of a class that can be learned in an exponential rate. So take X to be uh, the discrete grid and H will just be a monotone half spaces. So half spaces whose uh, normal is in the, in the positive orth hand. And uh, so this class is learnable at rate e to the minus N and you can actually analyze the online learning uh, game here and it's a nice Ramsey argument. Um, but here, by the way, ERMs cannot achieve the optimal rates. So arbitrary ERMs cannot, and I think even in this case, no proper learner can achieve uh, an optimal, the, the exponential rate. Every proper learner will have rate which is uh, slower than exponential, I think, but for sure not every ERM, this we have an example. So this, so this really separates between different kinds of ERMs. Um, yes, so the second item is, is based on a similar approach. Right, so you have rate one over n if and only if there is no infinite VCL tree, which is another kind of a tree, I will not define it. And here also you have like a, you can also interpret it as, as if you have a preference list, but not, now not of hypothesis, but rather of VC classes. So it's kind of like SRM in some sense, intuitively, but the, I'm just uh, relating to your previous question. Okay. So I think that's it about, uh, about the universal rates. Any questions? What about perceptron? I mean, the, the examples that you gave is very specific uh, abstractness. Why it's not work for perceptron? It has a mistake one. 
Yeah, I think, okay, so the issue with running just a finite mistake bound algorithm is the following. So it is true. So, okay, so imagine you have a reliable distribution and you have your perceptron or any algorithm with a finite mistake bound. And now you take an infinite sample from your distribution. Now, there is a random variable, which is the number of mistakes or the time of the last mistake, let's say, of the algorithm, right? So on this infinite sequence, if you run your online algorithm, then eventually it will start making mistake. And you can consider this random variable of when was the last mistake. The issue is that this random variable, it's, right, it's a random variable over the natural numbers. It's a distribution over natural numbers. It might have very, very, very heavy tail. It might have even an infinite expectation. And that's why, um, and I think you can even cook examples like this, even for the perceptron. And that's why we had to, to aggregate it, to do some kind of boosting uh, argument. So you apply it on several batches and you, you basically, in the end, you take a majority vote after you do some testing. But my point is that Mistake bound algorithms do not have exponential rate immediately. You need to, to worry about, about such, for such issues that might arise. Okay, so now let me tell you about um, the second work, which again here also we, we consider a very simple variant of the classical definition. Now this will be distribution free, but there is also room to make it uh, universal. Um, okay, so the motivation is that in practical problems, the data often satisfies special properties that is learning. So for example, high dimensional data might lie on a low dimensional surface. Another example is when we have margin, you know, classification with margin. And what we, the, the, the approach we consider is, is to basically extend the classical definition of, of fact learning by allowing partial concepts. And these are simply functions that can be undefined on certain parts of the space. And we already, yeah, okay. So a total concept is just a function from H, H from X to zero one. And the partial function, we also have stars. Stars mean it's undefined. And the support of a partial function, partial concept is, is the set where it's not equal to stars. And uh, this allows us to, in a very natural way, to express data dependent assumptions. So for example, the, the class of linear classifiers with margin gamma simply contains all functions that are not defined near the hyperplane. They are, they are like a half space, but they are not defined close to the boundary. Similarly, if you assume that your data lies on a low dimensional manifold, so you can take all functions whose support is a low dimensional manifold from some family and uh, otherwise it's undefined. And so it's really convenient to model like this using the classical, using the pack learning uh, uh, framework, data dependent assumptions. Um, another nice thing is that all the mathematical um, parameters that we use in, in the classical path learning theory, they naturally extend to partial concepts, right? So, um, ah, so maybe, the, yeah, so the definition. So we say that, uh, so I want to, to define what is a realizable distribution. So first we define what is a realizable sample. So a sample S is realizable by a class H if all examples are consistent with some function in H. Right, so it means that this function in particularly is defined everywhere on the sample. And the distribution is realizable if with probability one, when you take a sample from it, it will be realizable. Okay, the error is defined in the same way. Um, and you can even define the Vichy dimension for partial concept classes. Right, so the VC dimension is the maximum number D, such that you can find D points, X1 up to XD. And when you take the restrictions of all functions, all, all partial functions in H to X1 up to XD, then you get something, you get every binary pattern. So you might get some stars, you ignore them, 
but you at least need to get all binary patterns. Okay. And then we can also define pattern ability in the realizable setting, exactly the same. So a class H of partial functions is back learnable. If there is a vanishing bound, the same definition, right? We have an algorithm that learns it in a distribution free manner. Um, yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, when you say realizable, you mean the support is the same as the function? And it's a little bit stronger than that, but yes. It is, a, yeah, yeah. You, you can think about this one, yes. The support of the distribution is the same as the support of the function, and then it's the same as the, the support system. of the distribution is the support of some function in the class. And the labels come also according to the function, right? So think about half sources with margin. So different functions might have different supports. That's my point. There's no one support. Um, okay. And the first result that I want to discuss here is that there are easy to learn partial classes that cannot be represented by a learnable class of total functions. So let's, so what do I mean by representing? So let's consider the following definition. So what, what do I mean that a total class represents a partial class? So we say that a partial class H is disambiguated by H prime, H prime is a total class, if every partial function has an extension in the total class, can be extended by some H prime, right? Right, so every partial function in the partial class can be extended to some total concept in the total class. And uh, Atias Mansour and Kondorovich ask the following question, can every learnable partial class be disambiguated by a learnable total class? And what we showed is that there exists a pack learnable partial class such that every class that disambiguates it must have an unbounded VC dimension. And in, in, particular, in particular, this uh, disambiguating class will not be packed on um, And let me just know that the proof exploits a very nice connection with communication complexity and graph theory, the construction of this class. I will tell you a little bit more later, maybe. Okay, so, so we know that these partial classes are more expressive. You can, you can express, um, you can model learnable tasks using partial uh, classes that you cannot model them using total classes. And by the way, one open question, which I think is very interesting is what, what happens with margin? Half this is margin in some, so pick some Hilbert space, look at all half places with margin, gamma. So this is the part, this partial class is learnable. Can one disambiguate it by a total class of functions, which has a finite VC dimension, namely only depending on gamma? Can you somehow take every uh, partial linear classifier and then disambiguate the stars to zeros and ones in some way so that the resulting class will have a, a bounded VC dimension? Um, okay. But let's go back to the question. So which partial concept classes are learnable and how, right? So we have this definition. We know it's more expressive, but now how do you, how do you learn? How, how do you learn there and what can you learn there? So what we showed is that indeed um, class is pack learnable if and only if it has a finite VC dimension. So the same theorem exp extends verbatim to the case of partial concept classes. However, the proof is fundamentally different than the one for total classes. So there is no ERM, no uniform convergence. What we use is uh, something that at least you two know very well, uh, one inclusion uh, algorithm. This is the, um, but, but yeah, these things don't appear in, in the proof. And not only do they not appear in the proof, they actually, we can show that they don't work. So, so here is a very important question, which again, I, unfortunately I don't have a satisfying answer neither in this case. Are there general principles in the spirit of uniform convergence in, and empirical risk minimization, which guide learning of partial concept classes, right? 
the nice thing about VC theory is that it gives us a very compelling and intuitive principle. And now we have a theory, can we derive one from there? So as I said, I don't have a satisfying answer. I'm thinking about it. I think it's, it's interesting, but we can show some ne negative results. We can show in a very strong sense that uniform convergence and DRM are unable to explain learning of partial concept classes. And this is similar also to what we observe in practice. So let me, how much time do I have? Okay, so, yeah. so let me elaborate a little bit on this now. So here is a very, very simple example why the most naive version of ERM fails. Right, so what would be the most naive version of ERM? Just pick a partial concept which is consistent with, uh, with the data. That's the most naive version of ERM. So I want to convince you that this fails miserably. So let's consider a class, which is basically always zero, but it is zero on some subset of size n over two, and otherwise it's undefined, right? So we have the domain is of size n, and then for every subset of size half, size n over two, there is a concept which is zero there, and is otherwise undefined. So first of all, this class is packed learnable, right? With sample complexity zero, right? You just output the all zero function. But, but note that it's an improper algorithm, right? It's not, it is not an AVRM. An AVRM will just tell you pick anything which is in the class, which is consistent with the data. So it's a very easy to learn class. However, it's a little bit like the no free lunch theorem for VC. Algorithms which are restricted to use partial functions from H they need omega of n examples to guarantee error less than one quarter. And why? Because they essentially have to learn the support of the target concept. And the support is an arbitrary subset of size n over two. So, uh, yeah, so such algorithms need to learn the support of the target function, which can be any subset of size n over two. So naive ERM fails. But how about more sophisticated ERMs? Is there a general reduction to empirical risk minimization? Right, so in the previous example, just take the class which consists of one function, the all zero function, and apply ERM on that class, this will work. This will learn the, pre the, the partial class. So this is in some sense a reduction from learning a partial class to learning a total class. Um, so can every learnable partial class be learned by minimizing the empirical loss over some total class? This is a question. And notice that I don't even require this total class to be learnable, but I do want that every ERM on the total class will learn the partial class. So no, so we can again show, and again, it's the same example like before. So there exists a partial class with this dimension one. Right, it's the simplest you can you can hope for. Suggests so for every candidate class you offer, total class, there will be a bad ERM. There will be some ERM that minimizes uh, the loss over the total class and will fail to learn the partial class. Another question is how complex must the output hypothesis be? Right. So we know again in the in the VC world, you can always use proper algorithms and they, uh, the hypothesis you use will be from the class. And if the visible is small, then you can think about it as having a few parameters. Is, is this the case here? Can you maybe at least properly learn any partial class using some restricted class of a finite VC dimension? All right, so informally, how many parameters are needed to represent the output hypothesis for an algorithm that learns a partial class? And again, we show that the same example, there exists class H, partial class H with this dimension one, such that every algorithm that learns it, the range, the set of possible hypotheses it might output have an unbounded VC dimension. So the number of parameters necessarily um, grows. So let me summarize. Um, yeah, so progress in practical machine learning poses major challenges to theory, and there is a significant effort in rethinking ML theory. 
and but you know many people not not here but i hear it a lot that we still it doesn't mean we should discard the the classical theories like back learning and the right doesn't mean we should burn it and throw it away i think we we saw today that you can modify them in a natural and intuitive way, allowing partial functions, allow for some dependence on the target distribution. And, you know, we don't know, we don't understand how to learn in this setting, but at least we have a formal and a clean uh, setting of learning, which we can explore and study. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have realizability as an assumption. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, we have realizability as an assumption. For yeah, we don't. We, you can remove it. It was just for the presentation. Okay. So, in the universal setting, actually, we didn't. Uh, we're still. I mean, it will appear in the journal version, but in the partial concept classes, it's already there in the paper. But in both cases, it, it is removable. Yeah. If it's not realizable, then you can get samples. Are you talking about the definition of agnostic learning for partial concept classes? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so it's a good point. How to? It's a good question. How to define? So basically, okay. Um, in a nutshell, you treat stars as mistakes. If it's undefined, then it's a mistake. But in the paper, we really try to give a definition which kind of reflects the distribution depend the data dependent um, motivate. You know, our motivation was to to to, to define learnability in a data dependent way, right? So, so every sample is re is realizable. So a uh, distribution is realizable if every sample is realizable. But there's no, we don't state anything about the some target function, that's, that's the way we defined it, right? So anyways, short answer is it starts our mistakes, okay? And then, but, but, we, but we, yeah, we tried to give a definition that, uh, that is more complex and, and uh, the goal was to really capture data dependent assumptions, to be able to capture data dependent assumptions in a natural way. Ah, so in diagnostic setting, the same in the partial classes, the same characterization applies. Um, uh, so finite VC is equivalent to learnability. There is one open question there. So as I said, uniform convergence fails, and in the, in the in the classical pack setting, we know that the optimal rates are d over epsilon squared. But you use chaining there, and uniform convergence, and we don't have this here. So here we still have this extra. Uh, log factor. So, if you care about these things, uh, it's an open question. Like, uh, what is the optimal rate in the in diagnostic setting? Um, by the way, another interesting for partial classes is that the sample compression conjecture fails. So, so it's still the case that you can uh, any class you can learn there is a compression scheme of uh, sublinear size, but but. Uh, uh, the same example, which I mentioned earlier, also is not compressible by a finite sample compression scheme. So, um, so yeah, it doesn't disprove the conjecture of Falmouth and Lillstone, but at least it shows that the proof needs to be quite strange if, if it is true, because it doesn't apply to partial classes. Um, yes. Okay, so thank you again, Chad, for being here. Yes, thank you for inviting me.